design their own religious expression of how they want God to work in their life. Whether we say that we have a relationship with Jesus, or whether we have a religion, or whether we have both, every human being at some point in time coordinates their lifestyle and their relationship with God to force God into being kind of a give me kind of sugar daddy respective person as opposed to being obedient to what God says. Because if we were obedient to what God says, then we would read His Word and we would do what it says. I mean, it would be that simple. It wouldn't be a question about what His will is or whether we have to argue about the relationship versus religion. Because the point of matter is, and the point of fact is that Jesus did what was written. Jesus was the fulfillment of all that was written about Him. And the Word of God is written about Him. So you see Him obeying the law. You see Him doing those things that were written in the Scriptures that would be fulfilled by His obedience to His Father and His Father's will. The question that we have to ask ourselves when we're looking at Tozer is, are we doing our will? Are we doing God's will? Because you see, it's so easy to get carried away into somebody else's will, meaning that you get involved in a group setting and suddenly you're involved in politics or you're involved in socialism or you're involved in doing something for someone. Where, What did God tell you to do? Where has God spoken to me about what it is that I should be doing? In other words, a lot of times people want to do something else other than get personal and real with what God is. And He is an examiner of the heart. He is an examiner of the motivations of the heart. He wants to get so int intimately and intricately involved in your life that He wants you to see where you're coming from when you step out to do something. Because, you see, most of the time you'll find that motivations, whether they're political, whether they're economic, whether they're business, whether they're family, whether they're relationships, or whether they're in religion, usually have some type of dual purpose involved in them. One is spiritual. God may have inspired it initially. But two is carnal, where Satan comes in and plants his own seed, so to speak, and our flesh gets involved in it, where we do things out of wrong motivations of the heart. We become less involved in what we need to change about ourselves and what we want to change in the world or in some situation circumstance. Typically, the first place that most Christians run away from God to is into politics. Because you see, as long as they're forcing the issue about politics and getting this great big group involved of group mentality that the group is going to accomplish something, then you no longer are taking personal responsibility for your own actions, your own attitude, and your own direction of what God is telling you to do. Because you see, the masses can go in one direction, but God may have you go the other. God may want you to minister to the one person where the masses will minister to supposedly thousands and leave millions behind, or minister to millions and leave thousands behind. God doesn't do that. He operates in the individual life, one to one. That's your ratio of how you should minister to yourself, one on one, you and God, one to one. It shouldn't be, oh, well, we're going to fix this by a group setting, you know, we're going to have the whole group work on me. No, that's not how God operates. God operates in the individual personal level, where he's speaking to you and you're speaking to him where you get to know Him and He knows you, and He reveals to you how much He knows about you and loves you anyways. That's where you begin to discover the grace and mercy of God, when you find out that God still loves you, even though He can reveal to you everything that you really are. And that's why we look at Tozer so much, is that we examine our motivations, we examine our heart, and then we examine why we are not spending the time in the Word, or we're not spending the time with Him like we should. We're spending time with groups. We're spending time with politics. We're spending time with television. We're spending time with worship teams. We're spending time in group settings rather than developing one-on-one, -on -one, first of all, our life in Him. Then bringing that benefit and that joy from who we are in Jesus to the group and then blessing them, not taking from them. Because have you ever seen that in a group where there's always a downer and there's an upper? You know, someone who seems to always be up and then someone else always seems to be down. And that everybody kind of balances off the two. You know, they kind of like, 
you know, and there's always these dynamics, you know, and they talk about group dynamics, and they talk about social interactions and all these different things. That's not the way that God operates. God wants to make us one. Not ten becoming one. One. That we all become one in the Spirit, one in the Lord. One in Jesus, even as he prayed that the disciples would be one. The Word of God, shortest route to spiritual peace. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto the perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Jesus. Ephesians 4.13 The work of God is not finished in the heart and life of a new believer when the first act of inward adjustment has given him a sense of cleansing and forgiveness, a sense of peace, uh, purpose, and rest for the first time in his life, no, though that may be overwhelming and to such a degree that the person feels like I've arrived, the greatest reality comes the next day when they realize, oh my gosh, there's so much more that I need to do and have done to me. The Spirit would go on from there to bring the total life into harmony with that blissful center. This is a rot in the believer by the word and by prayer and by discipline and by suffering. It's funny how people avoid those things and when they're talking about getting saved. They always say about God's going to give you abundant life, but they don't talk about how you're going to have to pay a price, that there is a cost to discipleship, that there's a cost to following Jesus, that there is something to be done besides just accepting what the Son has done for you. There is also a calling on you and there is an election for you to move into that direction that God has chosen for you to become all that He wants you to be. God doesn't leave you alone. He doesn't say, thank you, I'm glad you got saved, now go your way and be in peace and then do what you want. No, he says, I purchased you with a price and you were so precious to me, I'm not going to leave you as you are, but I'm going to make you better than you ever dreamed you could possibly be so that you will become all that I want you to be. Look at my son and you'll see what I'm doing and you'll see how it's going to be done. It could be done by a shorter course in things spiritual if we were more pliable and less self-willed and stubborn. But it usually takes some time before we learn the hard lessons of faith and obedience sufficiently well to permit the work to be done within us, with anything near to perfection. More often than not, self always invades. That's why Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. The unspoken, the unrepeated, the gospel message that's not stated anymore in the relationship that we give to those newborn Christians is the very fact that you must deny yourself. You must take up your cross. You must follow Jesus. It's almost like a three-step part, but it's not. It's really all one. But denial of self has to come involved and be there in that place where you realize that in you there dwells no good thing, so of course you deny yourself. You allow God to live inside you. You allow him by his spirit to manifest himself through you as you are ministered inside you all about you and to people that you wouldn't even know that you would accomplish to love like your enemies and the only way you could do that would be that God is in you allowing his spirit to love through you because you know darn well that you can't love your enemies and neither can I but God in us can and that's the difference it's always been by His Spirit and not by works of flesh which we have done, but according to His righteousness with which He saved us, but which with which He empowers us to be able to do those things that He has given us His Spirit to be able to do by way of gifts and by way of fruits of the Spirit and by way of His very nature living inside of us so that we can say, it's no longer I that liveth, but Christ liveth in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the will of the Son of God who died for me and gave Himself for me. It is Jesus alive in me because it's obvious what I do when I'm only me, but it's more obvious what he does when it's him in me, because then he's able to do all and accomplish all that I could never do. The Word of God, well understood and religiously obeyed, is the shortest route to spiritual perfection, and we must not select a few favorite passages to the exclusion of others. It is all in all in the volume of the book. For lo, in the volume of the book it is written of him, and we want all of Jesus, not some of him. Any tinkering with the truth, any liberties taken with the scriptures, and we throw ourselves out of symmetry and invite stiff discipline and severe chastisement from that loving Father who wills for us nothing less than full 
restoration into the image of God that was in Christ Jesus. So, what you can do and you can look at is to see Jesus and to understand how he loved, the way he loved and who he loved, and become like in that. Because that's the destination that God is bringing us to. That is the prize. That is the goal. That is what God is doing in us. That is his work in us. Now, his work for us is to accomplish and be accomplished in sharing the world that same perspective with which he has taught us up to this day. The same mercy that he's given us, we give to others. The same peace that he's given us, we give to others. The same love that he loved us, even when we didn't love him, we love others. We do as Jesus did. So in so saying, and in so living, then don't be surprised if in so dying, we must become likened unto him, fit for a cross, our own cross that we bear, that one day we may die there, so that he may live and cause us to rise from the dead. Once again, proving what God's will is in this world, that we are not of this world, but we have a world waiting for us, a spiritual dimension, a spiritual reality that goes far beyond death. O death, where is thy sting, which is swallowed up in victory, for God has done this thing, that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus, that we will be brought into fellowship with him and made one likened unto him. We shall be, and even now we appear to be, the sons and daughters of God. But when he appears, we know not what we shall be, but we know that we shall be like him. And having been made into that conformable image likened unto him, we know that we'll rejoice in that day, because finally, 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 we'll be just like Jesus. Just like Jesus. Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what we all want when we study Tozer? When we get to the reality of the gut-wrenching truths that we find out in ourselves, we really are messed up, that we really have a lot of junk inside, a lot of gunk that needs to be cleaned out till we're shiny again. It's easy to get caught up in self-will, and it's easy to get caught up in distractions. The main thing and the only thing that we can do is to read the Word, to read the Word, and to read the Word. And as we read the Word, to treat it as God speaking to us. Because God will speak audibly to us, but He also has spoken to us through the Word of God, as well as revealed it to us in the person of Jesus, who is the Word of God. So we have it physically, we can have it emotionally, we have it audibly, and we have it visually. So with the Word of God reading it, we will be changed as we read it daily, daily, considering it in our heart soulfully and applying it to our lives emotionally and living it out physically as we do the Word of God, obedience to what we read. That's what God calls us to do, for to obey is better than sacrifice. And as we walk with Him and talk to Him, and as we relate through the scriptures to that with which God is doing in us, we will find, even in the midst of tribulation, peace in this world and peace with God.